Educating your clients properly is one of the most powerful things you can do in your practice. Business of Architecture, episode 256. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you haven't already, head on over to freearchitectgift.com to pick up my free four-part architecture firm profit map video. Enter your best email address on that page and you will get instant access. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sage Glass is the manufacturer of highly intelligent, reliable, dynamic glass. Sage Glass tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while maintaining unobstructed views of the outdoors. Visit sageglass.com to see the future of the built environment for yourself. In today's episode, you get a consulting session with yours truly. We're going to talk about why clients always question your fees, what's going on there, and how to fix it so that clients pick you every time, even if you are the most expensive option. Wow, that's a lot of money. I had no idea it was going to be that expensive. If you've ever heard that before, then you've probably presented a proposal to a client at some time. Now, as an architect or a designer, we hear this all the time from our clients when we present them with proposals. And there's a couple things that happened to me in the past week that brought this to my mind and reminded me that there is an excellent fix for this. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in today's episode, but more on that later. First, I'm gonna share with you the first story that kind of brought this front and center to my mind. I was over at a friend's house, we were having a little swim party, and he had just added on, in the process actually, of adding on a 16 by 20, very small single car garage uh, behind his house. It comes right off of a side street because he's on a corner lot. And as he was showing me the uh, the garage, uh, he was just going on and on about how much more expensive it was than he thought it was going to be. He talked about the inspectors. He talked about how the city wasn't letting him do certain things. He talked about how he went into a drafts person who's not even licensed and wanted to get uh, the, the plans drawn up. And he said that he went ahead and proceeded with the work without even asking this draft person about how much he would charge. The bill came back, it was, he said it was like $2,200, and he said literally his jaw dropped and he got instantly angry because he felt that was such, he just felt like he was getting taken to the cleaners. He was totally getting ripped off. And so I paused for a second, I said, um, yeah, well, let me, let me look at the plans. What did he give you, you know? And so he pulled out the plans. I, I leafed through them, he showed them to me. And he said, yeah, I was standing over his shoulder and I saw all he did was he just selected some lines and then he just pressed print, you know? And I said, well, how much time did he say that it took him? He said, well, it said it took him about 40 hours. And I said, well, you know, in my estimation for me uh, to do a set of plans, even if it's for a garage, um, you know, it's non-standard like yours. Well, it's, it's going to take some time for me to go through all my notes, make sure that the applicable notes are on there, make sure I have the right details on there. Uh, it might not take me, tw- uh, you know, 40 hours, but it might take me 30, you know, after making sure that I research the codes, research the zoning, make sure everything's in order, coordinate with a structural engineer if there's any structural things that need to happen. And, but my friend just could not accept the fact that that was a fair price to draft his garage. Now, of course, we're talking about a very, very small project here, but he was telling me, as my friend was, now, mind you, this friend of mine, he's brilliant guy very very smart he has um he's on a prominent position in one of the local uh city government positions um he is actively involved in the community so he's a smart guy he's been around building and and construction a lot but it was i was amazed to see um the lack of knowledge or the assumptions that were put on the building process uh, because he just didn't know the way it really is. And so another story, he told me that he had, uh, when they helped, when they set up this particular garage, he said he had a couple contractor friends come over. And these guys, he said one of the guys used to build, you know, tilt up panel like Costco's and the other guy used to be like a, I don't know, a, a, a concrete contractor or something like that. And both the guys said, oh, this isn't how houses are built. You know, all these details are from another part of California. We don't use those kind of details here. And of course, I looked at the plans and 
what I could see the draftsman had done is that he'd provided several different options for how to comply with, for instance, like a portal frame, you know, for the garage when you don't have enough room on the side to get a real braced wall panel in there. Of course, it gives you different options for having a sheer wall. You can use a Simpson strong wall. You can use something like a portal frame. And so the draftsman threw in a couple details. Well, my buddy apparently didn't even read the plans correctly. And so when he poured his concrete and was doing the work on the house or on, on this garage, it was totally done incorrectly. So in that one moment, as I was sitting here and listening to the frustration of my friend feeling like he had gotten taken to the cleaners, uh, when he said all that he wanted was a very simple garage, it made me remember how little our clients, potential clients know about what we do. And this is what I call the curse of the expert. So the, what is the curse of the expert? The curse of the expert is when we as professionals have so much experience doing something that we forget what it's like to be someone who's outside of our industry or someone who doesn't have that expertise. So a lot of the things that the codes require, right, they are for code reasons that things that might never happen, right? Your, your house may never burn down, but here in California, Fire sprinklers are required, right? You may never have a fire in your garage, but we still require self-closing doors on the garage and 5-H inch chipboard fire rated enclosure there to prevent the spread of fire to your house. And a lot of times, you know, when, when people look at this, they, they see, and maybe not those exact examples, but they see these requirements as being unnecessary and they're just adding to the cost of construction and they're just making it more expensive. And I don't see why I need to do that or that architect or that designer obviously doesn't know what they're talking about. So they check with their friends who have no knowledge on what it takes to do the kind of products that you do. Their friends or, or the, whoever they're talking to is filling their head with all sorts of suppositions and about the way that things are supposed to be. So what we have here is we have a crisis of ignorance and it plagues especially the residential industry uh, around the world, not just here in the United States, but not just the residential. If you're if you're not a residential architect, if you don't do single family homes, I guarantee this still applies to you. There are things about what you do, whether you do operating rooms, whether you do higher education, that your clients don't understand the value that you're bringing to the project. Now, let me tell you my second story here. This is, I was over at my sister's house and we were discussing the remodel that my wife and I are planning to do to our home. And as I was talking to my, um, my sister, I told her that my next door neighbor right across the street from me is a general contractor and they do fantastic residential products, do excellent work. And so I was asking him just kind of for a square foot price, taking a look at my plans and saying, okay, do you think, what do you think the budget of this is? Now, where I'm at this day right now here in California, He's building homes for, and these are remodels, by the way. He's remodeling. He says it's coming out to around $200 a square foot. Now, if you're in a big city, that may seem extremely cheap. I know places where it runs 300, 400 US dollars a square foot. If you're out there in a rural area somewhere, that may seem a lot. You may be able to do it for 125, but right here, it's about 200 bucks a foot. And of course, that seemed a lot to me uh, because I haven't been building custom homes or I haven't been designing them in a while. And, but I trust him because he's a contractor that I know, I like him, I trust him, I know that they do excellent work. But here's what's interesting. When I told my wife that I had gotten this budget, I think we're gonna be adding around a around thousand feet. So I said, yeah, you know, he said kind of back of napkin that this project would cost about $200,000, 200 bucks a square foot. And my sister's jaw just dropped. She said, wow. She said, well, you went to the wrong contractor. She said, I know that contractor. I'm not going to mention his name right here on the podcast, but she said, they are the premium contractor in town. Everyone knows that when you go to them, they're going to be way more expensive than all of your other options. She says, oh, did you try checking with X and X? And she threw out a couple different names of different contractors. Now, I hadn't checked with those other contractors, but based upon my knowledge as an architect and having done residential homes for years and years and years and understanding how the building industry is played and especially the kind of business that my friend, this contractor across the street runs, I responded to my sister in this way. I said, listen, Sue, the name of my sister, I said, I said, what I find in the building industry is that you get what you pay for you get what you pay for. Sure, if you're in a large city, there may be contractors out there that are so busy that they'll throw out just a super high number because they don't really need the work and maybe they they um, they only work on premium style products. But I said, this particular contract here in our area, I know that he wasn't throwing out one of those bids. When he says 200 bucks a square foot, I'm pretty confident that when you factor in the plumbing, when you factor in all the utilities, when you factor in everything, that's probably a good 
a good fit. And she said, oh no, you know, I know that so-and-so said that they can do it. This should be more like a hundred bucks a square foot. You should talk to such and such a contractor. Well, let's fast forward a couple days. I had the chance to sit down with my friend, the premium contractor who lives across the street. I told him my conversation with my sister and he just chuckled. He said, yeah, we do have that reputation in town that we're the premium contract, that we're more expensive than every, anyone, everyone else. But he said, we're barely charging enough to cover our overhead and have a little bit of profit. So they charge about 10%. Well, on a side note, I told him they're, they're undercharging. But he said, we're just charging enough barely to get by. Uh, the reason why our projects cost more is because the subs we use, they do excellent work that we can stand behind. There's never any problems with it. And he told me about some of the other contractors in town, and I know this is typical, depending on where you're at. He said that they'll throw out a very low bid. They'll either try to make it up in changes or they'll try to make it in the owner allowances by throwing in cheaper materials, cheaper, uh, what uh, you know, basically cheaper construction. Um, or they'll employ subcontractors that just aren't careful about their work. I mean, it shows when you go in there. So going back to this conversation with my sister, what I explained to her, I said, listen, when you have a set of plans, those plans only have so much detail in them. The more detail an architect or designer puts in the plans, the more the architect or designer is going to charge you because it takes more time, generally. The more detail that you have in the plans, the more sure you can be of the outcome you're going to get. If you don't have that information, if you don't have, for instance, the level of finish of drywall that you want to have in the house, well, what if the contractor says, oh, we'll just throw up a level one finish or not even that, right? You have wavy walls, you have some spackle that looks horrible, you know, your nail holes are popping out, right? You need to specify that in the plans. And this is something that the people, the clients we work with, they don't understand that this information needs to be called out. They don't understand that expectations need to be written down. That's why we have contract documents. That's why we have plans. So as I was sitting down with my contractor friend over lunch and we were just talking about a little bit more in depth about my particular plans for my remodel, I was asking him about the price differences, why some contractors in the area charge 120 uh, or not charge, but would build for about that. And then others are, you know, like him, is, you know, they're saying that's about 200 bucks a square foot. And, you know, he gave me several great examples. He said, you know, well, one example is just the way that they install the doors. You know, we'll take time to make sure we, we shim out the rough opening. Well, that seems like basic standard practice to me before you put the door in. And he said, you know, whereas we'll charge 50 bucks an hour and it'll take us four, four hours to put in a door because we're shimming it, we're making sure it closes correctly. And this was just an example. He said, you know, our competitors, they may charge 80 bucks and they'll spend one hour on the door. So, the, long, the, the, the moral of our story here, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, is that you get, ultimately you get what you pay for. Third example, with our remodel that my wife and I are going to be doing soon on our house, uh, I had three options for engineers. I ended up choosing the most expensive engineer in town because I know what goes into that number. I know why they're more expensive. I don't want to have pains in the, in the job field. I want to know that if I want to change something on site, if I want to make some change, I can get that into the engineer. They will you know, they won't roll their eyes at me. They'll say, that's great, Enoch. We can do this. Or have you thought about doing it this way? That's what I'm going for there. Now, here's the thing. Your clients don't understand all the intricacies. So when we talk about how can we fix this problem, this is a, this is a solvable problem. As I said, we are in a crisis of ignorance right now. And I know other industries suffer with this as well. You know, with this as well. You have uh, doctors are complaining about people who go online and they're self-diagnosing. Accountants, you know, same thing. They're suffering from people going there and, and think they understand everything about the tax code. So let's bring it back to architecture and design. What is the solution for this? The solution is that we need to educate our clients. It's a simple matter of educating them, helping them understand what goes into what we do as architects. And if you do this, you will become the leader of your market. You will be seen as someone who's liked, known, and trusted. Educate is so powerful. So I'm going to give you right now five different ways to educate your potential clients. So what should you educate them about? It could be something about the difference between drywall finishes. It could be, look, did you know there's five different levels of drywall finish? There's a level one, level five. There may be more than that. I don't even know, right? But you could give a video talking about that. So here's different ways you could educate your client. Number one, you could record videos. 
It could be something simple. Today, the iPhone and the smartphones have such powerful cameras in them and microphones. If you just set it up on a little tripod on your desk, you can record, you can record on the job site. Just do a talking head video where you're walking someone through, maybe you're even at a job site and you can demonstrate it. That's the first way that you're gonna be able to educate your clients is through video. The second way is to write articles. Maybe you don't feel good on camera. You're much, it's much easier for you to write something down. You could write an article, put it on your blog, share it on Facebook, share it on social media. Number three, record a podcast. Get a cheap microphone. Doesn't have to be super expensive. You can buy a very nice broadcast quality microphone for about $200. You can get a, a, a inexpensive headset for about 30 US dollars. In any case, the point is, is that podcasts are very easy to record. You can find information online about how to do that. And once again, just imagine that each episode, you're educating your clients about one aspect of design or what you do and why going for the cheapest option is not necessarily the smartest choice. Not only not the smartest choice, but absolutely could lead to disaster. And I'm sure you have tons of horror stories about things that have happened. I know I certainly do. So number three is to record a podcast. Number four is to give seminars or to give webinars. These are great ways. Seminar, of course, would be in person. If you can round up a group of people, you can educate them there. Uh, on webinars, you could create a presentation about your building process, about common mistakes that people see when they design. Look, the fact of the matter is that the Home and Garden TV is out there educating the public on what design is. And if you want people to have a different perspective about what you do as an architecture firm or what you do as a design firm, you have the power now with the digital technology we have to be able to get your message out there and to be able to educate your clients. So number four is to give seminars or webinars. And number five is simply to write a book. Books are still one of the most powerful medium out there. It could be an ebook that's available on Amazon. It could be a physical book that people can buy off of your website. So there's my five tips for educating your clients. Number one, record videos. Number two, write articles. Number three, re record a podcast. Number four, give seminars or webinars. And number five, write a book. What you'll find when you educate your clients is that an educated client is a confident client. A confident client is a client that trusts you. A confident client is a client that wants to pay you money, that is willing to pay you for your expertise. So educating your clients properly is one of the most powerful things you can do in your practice. So when should you educate your client? There's lots of opportunities to do that. You can do that on your website. You can do it through email. So when a new client signs up to your email list or when they're getting ready to meet with you, you can have some emails set out that start to educate them on different aspects of your prog progress, different uh, process, different aspects of the process for working with you or getting the kind of products that they want done. So you can do it via email. Uh, you can do it on your website. You can do it on your social media posts. And then of course you can always tell people face to face. So let me know what you thought about this episode. If you like it, subscribe to the Business of Architecture podcast on iTunes, subscribe on YouTube, and let me know what horror stories have you seen from people that thought they were saving money in the short term, but they ended up paying for it in the long term. Remember, the best thing you can do to help gain the trust of your clients is to educate them. We need you to spread your message and the digital tools exist to be able to do that. Let me know what you thought about this episode. You can do that by going over to the Business of Architecture Facebook group. As always, carpe diem. And that's a wrap. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core and Sage Glass. BQE Core is the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sage glass is a special kind of glass that tints automatically to optimize daylight, reduce glare, and manage heat, all while maintaining unobstructed views of the outdoors. Sage glass gives you the freedom to design beautiful buildings unconstrained by the sun. You can create better, more sustainable spaces for people to learn, create, heal, and work. Visit sageglass.com to see the future of the built environment. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world.